right, today is September 19th, 2015, on our calendar here in the United States, and on the Hebrew calendar, the 6th of Tishri, 5776. So, this is the first Shabbat of the new year. We are going to continue today in the series of messages from Nehemiah, from Nehemiah. And I've entitled the message today, Owning Your Piece of the Wall. And just as a very quick review of last week, um, we covered chapters 1 and 2 of Nehemiah, and uh, we likened the condition of Jerusalem to the body of Messiah. And the uh, body of Messiah as uh, today, okay? Um, we talked about the fact that the walls are broken down, the gates burned up, which makes the city completely vulnerable to any kind of attack from man or beast. And we read that there was this remnant group of people, descendants of, of people who had been there for a long time, that occupied the city. And although they were good people and godly people, they had grown accustomed and comfortable with living in those conditions. Um, and they didn't have any kind of, of impetus to change the situation. Um, and, but God said it wasn't good for Jerusalem to be that way. And so he laid it upon the heart of Nehemiah to take some action. And one of the things that we talked about first, he prayed about the situation, which solidified the burden that was in his heart, that something needed to change. And it also built even more of a zealousness in him to see something happen, but he also knew that he couldn't do this, he couldn't just do it on a whim, and he couldn't do it without planning, and he couldn't do it by himself. And so he began, the Lord began giving him plans and strategies, he waited on the timing of the Lord, which happened to be a situation that could have gotten him killed, where he came into the presence of the king with a sad face, and the king wanted to know why he was sad. And, and it made him very afraid. And yet he was thinking, well, I'm probably dead already, so I might as well go for it. And he spills the beans as to what is burdening him. And the king, instead of, instead of the king saying, well, off with your head, the king says, well, what do you need? And um, so he already had the answer thought out before he was ever asked. Um, and so the king gives him what he needs. He takes off and he goes to Jerusalem. He doesn't say anything to anyone in the beginning. Instead, uh, after about three days, he rides around the city in the dark and assesses the situation. And once he has a proper assessment, then he presents his ideas and goals to the people. And that's all they needed. They needed someone to be a catalyst for them. They thought it was an, an awesome idea, and they backed Nehemiah 110%. So that was what we talked about that happened last Shabbat, 
This Shabbat, we're going to start with chapter 3 of Nehemiah, which is on page 1132 in the Complete Jewish Bible. Those of you who are not using the Complete Jewish Bible, you're just going to have to find it on your own. Nehemiah is one of those books that people don't go to very often, and so a lot of people have a hard time finding where it is in the Bible. So we're going to read, we're going to read the chapter first, and then we'll start talking about it like we did the last time. And now this one, you're going to have to hang in there with me because there's a lot of, a lot of detailed stuff information about who was where and what they did and, and it just goes on and on and on naming people and sections of wall and so on so there's a lot of that kind of information then Eliashiv the Kohen Hagadol set out with his fellow Kohanim and they re rebuilt the sheep gate they consecrated it and set up its doors they consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred and onto the Tower of ha Hananael. Next to him, the men from Jericho built. Next to him, Zakur, the son of Imui, built. The sons of Haznaah rebuilt the fish gate. They installed its timbers framework and set up its doors along with its bolts and bars. Next to them, Megremot, the son of Uriah, the son of Hakots, made repairs. Next to them, Meshulam, the son of Berachiah, the son of Mesh, yeah, uh -huh. Meshezavael, made repairs. Next to them, Zadok, the son of Baana, made repairs. Next to them, the men from Tekoa made repairs, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work of their Lord. Yoyada, the son of Peseach, and Meshulam, the son of Besodia, made repairs to the old city gate. They installed its timber framework and set up its doors along with its bolts and bars. Next to them, Melatya, the, Ge the Gevioni, Yadon, the Meronoti, and the men from Givaon and Mitzpah made repairs. They worked for the people associated with the governor of the territory beyond the Euphrates River. Next to them, Uziel, the son of Harhayah, goldsmiths, made repair. Next to him, Hanania, one of the perfume makers, made repairs. They renovated Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Next to them, Rephayah, the son of Hur, leader of half the district of Jerusalem, made repairs. Next to him, Yadiyah, the son of uh, Harumaf, made repairs opposite his own house. Next to him, Atush, the son of Hashavniah, made repairs. Milkiah, the son of Harim, and Hashuv, the son of Pachat Moav, made repairs on another section and on the tower of the ovens. Next to him, Shalom, the son of Halochesh, leader of half the district of Jerusalem, he and his daughters made repairs. Hanun and the people living in Zanoach repaired the valley gate. They rebuilt it and set up its doors along with its bolts and bars, and they rebuilt 1,500 feet of the wall as far as the dung gate. Malkiah, the son of Rechav, leader of the district of Beit Hacharem, repaired the dung gate. He rebuilt it and set up its doors along with its bolts and bars. Shalun, the son of Kol Jose. Hey, there's Jose. <laughs> Leader of the district of Mitzpah re repaired the fountain gate. He rebuilt it 
covered it and set up its doors along with its bolts and bars. He also rebuilt the wall of the pool of Shelach by the royal garden as far as the stairs that go down from the city of David. After him, Nehemiah, the son of Azbuk, leader of half, of half the district of Beit, Beit Zur, made repairs from the place opposite the tombs of David as far as the artificial pool and the soldiers' barracks. After him, the Leviim made repairs. Rechum, the son of Bani. Next to him, Hash, Hashaviah, leader of half the district of Keilah, made repairs for his district. After him, their colleagues, Bavai, the son of Hanadad, leader of half the district of Keilah, made repairs. Next to him, Ezer, the son of Yeshua, leader of Mitzpah, made repairs on another section opposite the ascent to the armory at the angle. After him, Baruch, the son of Zakai, worked diligently making repairs on another section from the angle to the door of the house of Eliashiv, the Kohen Hagadol. After him, Meremot, the son of Uriah, made repairs on another section from the door of the house of Eliashiv to the end of the house of Eliashiv. After him, the Kohanim from the plain made repairs. After them, Binyamin and Hashuv made repairs opposite their house. After them, Azariah, the son of Maaseiah, the son of Ananiah, made repairs next to his house. After him, Binui, the son of Hanadad, repaired another section from the house of Azariah to the angle and to the corner. Palal, the son of Uzai, made repairs opposite the angle and the tower that projects out from the upper part of the royal palace near the courtyard of the guard. And it keeps going. There's a lot of stuff to repair. After him, Padiyah, the son of Parosh, made repairs since the temple servants were living in the Ophel, as far as opposite the water gate to the east and the tower that projects out. After them, the men from Tekoa repaired another section opposite the great tower that projects out and onto the wall of the Ophel. Above the horse gate, the Kohanim made repairs, each one opposite his own house. After them, Sadok, the son of Emeo, made repairs opposite his house. After him, Shemayah, the son of Shekanyah, the keeper of the east gate, made repairs. After him, Hananyah, the son of Shelemyah, and Hanun, the sixth son of Zalaf, made repairs on another section. After him, Meshulam, the son of Berakiah, made repairs opposite his own room. After him, Malkiah, one of the goldsmiths, made repairs as far as the house of the temple servants and the merchants, opposite the mustering gate, and onto the upper room at the corner. Finally, between the upper room at the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and merchants made repairs. Phew! Okay. And now we get to move on with the story. But, but, when Sanvalet uh, heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he was furious. Greatly enraged, he ridiculed the Judeans. Before his kinsmen and the army of Shomron, he said, What are these pathetic Judeans doing? Are they going to rebuild anything they want? Are they going to sacrifice? Are they going to finish today? Are they, are they going to recover useful stones from the piles of rubble, burned rubble at that? Tovia, the Ammoni, was with him, and he said, Whatever they're building, why, even if a fox went up on it, he'd knock their stone wall down. Our God, listen. We are being treated with contempt. Turn back their jeers on their own heads. Give them over to be plundered in a land of exile. Don't cover their guilt. Don't let their sin be wiped out from before you because they have insulted the builders to their face. So we kept building the wall, which was soon joined together and completed to half its height all the way around because the people worked with a will. 
very important statement. <laughs> now what I find interesting is the very first person that is mentioned as beginning the repairs is the Kohen Haggadol. That is not, I don't think that's coincidental for a lot of reasons. But not only him, but the other priests were involved in the process. And it's also interesting what they ended up repairing. Because specifically what they repaired was the sheep gate. Do you guys know what the sheep gate is? Anybody? Let me see a hand of somebody who knows what the sheep gate is. Okay. So a couple people. This was the gate through which they would bring the sheep into the temple compound in order to sacrifice them. Okay? The sheep were raised in Beit Lechem. Okay? And the priests would have to travel down to Beit Lechem and get the sheep for the temple, not the ones that people would bring in for themselves, but the ones that were to be sacrificed on behalf of the temple compound. Those were the ones that were raised down in Beit Lechem, and they had to travel down there and get those sheep and bring them back into Jerusalem. And it was through the sheep gate that they would bring them. That was the reason why it was called the sheep gate. Okay? Now it's interesting this is the only section of the wall that the text tells us was consecrated specifically. Okay? The part that the, that the Kohen Haggadol and the priests built and restored ended up being consecrated to the Lord. Okay? Now, I, I personally believe that it was very important for this particular group to lead the others in this work for the Lord. This is always the way that it is, it's supposed to be um, because it, sp it sends a powerful spiritual message that the people in spiritual leadership are going to go first Anytime restoration of something that's broken down, anytime there's restoration that is to be done, those in spiritual leadership need to go first in making the restoration. And so it was a very powerful message to the rest of the people. Now here's, here's one of the things that I want to point out and make application to us. Because... One of the things that happens, and I would say that this is probably typical of any congregation, any organization, any, any group, is that the people that are associated with and involved in that group end up thinking, well, I don't have the skills necessary to do anything to help. And it's interesting to find out the kinds of people that ended up wielding a trowel as we read through this passage. I want to give us a list of the kinds of people that built this, the wall around Jerusalem, Obviously the priests we just talked about. How about the Givioni? Anybody know anything about the Givioni? Givioni or Gibeonites, I'm going to recall to your memory, the story of the Gibeonites. 
You remember as the people of Israel, with Yehoshua in the leadership, entered into the land and began taking possession of it, the Lord had already spoken to the people of Israel and said, Do not, under any circumstances, enter into a covenant with any of the peoples that live in the land. And so they said, Okay, we will not enter into a covenant with the people in the land. One of the very first things that happens to this group when they come in is there is this group of people called the Gibeonites. They show up because they're afraid of Israel. They want to enter into a covenant with Israel so that they will not be attacked and destroyed. So they come up with a plan to fool the people of Israel. And they come with looking like they have been traveling for a long time, with all of their leather cracked and worn, patched water bottles, dry moldy bread, and they give this big story to Yehoshua and the leadership of Israel about how they've traveled so far because they've heard about the reputation of Israel and they want to enter into a covenant with Israel. Turns out... They were locals. And so Yehoshua and the leadership of Israel don't go to God and ask about this situation. Instead, they say, sure, come on in. And they enter into a covenant with this people group. And it's not until after the covenant has already been made that they find out this wasn't some distant group of people after all. And they have entered it, done the very thing God said not to do. And God says, if you had asked me, I would have told you. Now, the Gibeonites play a role numerous times throughout history as we read through the Scripture. And in fact, there were some sons of Saul that ended up being killed and hung on the wall of Jerusalem because of something that Saul did years prior where Saul actually killed Gibeonites against the, co the um, covenant that they had made with the people of Israel and God called that family to account of violating the covenant. Even though they shouldn't have entered into that covenant to begin with, God honored the covenant. And the sons of Saul were punished as a result. The, a plague broke out on the people of Israel, and the only way that it could be stopped was for the sons of Saul to be, to be killed and hung, displayed on the wall, and then the plague stopped. Okay? And it was because of violating that covenant. So this is the people group. Okay? People group that have basically, because they entered into covenant with the people of Israel, they basically in, kind of integrated, and, and not that they became Jews, they didn't necessarily convert to being Jews, but they still lived with the Jewish people in Israel and still partnered with them to do things. And so here we've got this group of Givyonim that are helping, just like other people, the Israelites, to rebuild this wall. During the list, uh, during what we've read, it's listed to us goldsmiths, perfume makers, Leaders of the two halves of Jerusalem, and for one of the leaders, his daughters also worked. District leaders and their sons, Leviim, city leaders, temple servants, and merchants. 
And God was very willing to use whoever would offer themselves to do this work. And I doubt that very many, if any of these people, were experienced stonemasons. But if they, if they had all said, when Nehemiah came to them and said, we need to rebuild this wall, if they had all said, I'm a goldsmith. I don't know how to do masonry. I can't do it. I'm a perfume maker. I don't know anything about stone masonry. I can't do it. If they had all done that, then this would not have happened. But they all said, God, I may not know how to do this, but you're going to show me and we're going we're to get this done. Okay? Because they had a will to do it. And of course, as they're working, guess who shows up? We can read in the Bible stories like this over and over, and we can read in history stories like this over and over. And we have today this story over and over. That when God decides that He is going to do something, then the enemy says, well, I'm going to raise up some people to try to put a stop to this. And so along comes Sanballat again, and Tovia, the Arabs, the Ammonim, and the Ashdodim in this particular case. And we, let's pick up with chapter 4. Chapter 4 is a short chapter, but we get a lot of information. But when Sanvalet, Tovia, the Arabs, the Ammonim, and the Ashdodim heard that the repairs on the walls of Jerusalem were going forward and the breaks were being filled in, they became very angry. All of them together plotted to come and fight against Jerusalem and thus throw us into confusion. However, we prayed to our God and because of them organized a watch against them day and night. Yehuda was saying, the strength of the people who carry loads away is starting to fail and there is so much rubble that we can't build the wall. Our enemies were saying, they won't know or see anything until we have already infiltrated them and begun killing them and stopping the work. And even the Judeans living near, near them came and must have said to us ten times, from every place you must come back to us. So in the lower parts of the space behind the wall, I stationed men according to their families with their swords, spears, and bows. After inspecting them, I stood up and addressed the nobles, leaders, and the rest of the people. Don't be afraid of them. Remember Adonai, who is great and fearful, and fight for your brothers, sons, daughters, wives, and homes. When our enemies heard that the plot was known to us and God had foiled their plans, we all returned to the wall, every one to his work. From then on, half of my men would do the work and half of them held the spears, shields, bows, and armor while the leaders stood guard behind the entire house of Yehuda. As they continued building the wall, uh, oh, excuse me, as they continued building the wall. Those who carried loads held their loads with one hand and carried a weapon in the other. And as for the construction workers, each one had his sword sheathed at his side. That is how they built. The man to sound the alarm on the shofar stayed with me. I said to the nobles, the leaders, and the rest of the people, this is a great work. 
and it is spread out. We are separated on the wall, one far from another. But wherever you are, when you hear the sound of the shofar, come to that place, to us. Our God will fight for us. So we kept doing the work. Half of them held spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. Also at that time I told the people, let everyone with a servant stay the night within Jerusalem, so that at night they can be guard for us even as they work during the day. I, my kinsmen, my servants, and my bodyguards never took off our clothes, and everyone who went to get water took his weapon. This was a serious, serious thing going on here. Because these, these people determined that they were going to kill the people of Israel and stop what God was doing. Sounds familiar. They wanted to throw everybody into fear and confusion and, and sideline them from, from the task. Now, in this particular description we have a couple new additions to the list of those that are coming up against them. And we've dropped one person. Okay? When we began, there were three um, Sanvalet the Hohoni, Tovia the Servant, and the Amoni, and Geshem the Arab heard about it. Now these three are named specifically. Now I don't know if Geshem is just part of the Arabs when it says the Arabs. Maybe Geshem is still part of that group. But he's not named again specifically. So we have those same three players, Sanvalet, Tovia, and possibly Geshem with the Arabs. But now we have Amonim and Ashdodim. Okay? So, who are these people? Well, Tovia was identified as an Ammoni um, last week when we, when we read. Who are the Ammonim? The Ammonim are descendants of Lot and Lot's youngest daughter. Okay? Now also at play here is the descendants of Lot and his oldest daughter, the Moavim. The Moavim are involved in this as well. So both, both descendants of Lot are involved in coming against the people of Israel. That's significant. Historically, that's significant because Abraham treated Lot well. Defended him. Saved his tuchus from destruction. And yet, here the descendants are coming against the people of Israel. Now what about the Ashdodim? Who were they? Well, Ashdod existed in the, in the territory that belong to the Pelishtim, the Philistines. Okay? So, the Philistines are getting involved now as well. Now, if you know anything about the map of Israel, Ashdod is actually quite a ways away from, from Jerusalem. And why they felt like they wanted to get involved in this, other than, other than their father, Hasatan, stirring them up, I don't know. It wasn't affecting them because it wasn't anywhere close to where they lived. Okay? But nevertheless, they, they join in as well. And they were historically always one of the thorns in Israel's side. And so, here they are again. So what is Nehemiah's response? Well, it, he, he responds by praying. Yet again, his first response is to pray, and that is excellent. 
I mean, that should always be our first response, is to take these kinds of things to the Lord. But unlike too many, unfortunately, too many believers in the body today in the United States, that's all they want to do is just pray. And sometimes the situation is serious enough where prayer is not the only thing that needs to be done. Okay? And uh, I think in this day and time, if we don't understand that, we need to begin understanding that. Okay? Because things are going to get ugly. And, uh, and it may require more than just prayer. Okay? So what, what does he do? Well... He, in great wisdom, he is very prudent and logical. He organizes a watch. And because according to his explanation of what's going on, he's basically got, he's being bombarded from, from all sides. And, and so it's like enough is enough. We're going to have to do something about this. And so he establishes this watch, as we read, and here's, here's the thing that I want to touch on. Too often, when people set out to do something that God told them to do, when they meet resistance, they begin questioning, well, did God really tell me to do this? Or did I just think I was supposed to do this? And, and now this resistance is actually God speaking, speaking to me and telling me that I was mistaken in what, I, what I'm doing and that I need to stop. Okay? And if I stop, then the resistance is going to go away. Well, here's the thing. You have to know that you know that you know that God has told you to do something. But once you do know that, then you don't let anything stop you. Anything or anyone stop you from doing what God has told you to do. What He's called you to do. And so in this case, it is obvious, it is confirmed, that this is something that God has orchestrated to happen. And so as these guys are coming up against them, they're not saying, well, you know, maybe we should stop so that these guys are not angry, angry at us for what we're doing. No, they say, okay, we, got it. we have to continue and we'll do whatever is necessary to continue. Even if, if it means we actually have to go to war with these guys and do battle against them, that's what we'll do, but this wall is going to be finished because God has ordained for it to be so. And so, Nehemiah gives them a speech. This wasn't a bunch of hype that he was speaking to them. And if we're talking, if we're likening this to the body of Messiah in its current condition, then it's not just a good story to talk about this and, and look at this. There actually are some things that need to happen. First of all, we can't be afraid of the enemy. That as we move forward with restoration, if God is calling us, and I believe that He is, as individuals and as a congregation, to play a key, maybe even catalyst role in restoration of the body of Messiah, we can't be afraid of the enemy. And 
What I want to say to you now in application is this. I want you to think about your husbands and your wives, your sons and your daughters, your parents, your brothers and your sisters. I want you to think about your home and your congregation. Fight for them. This is a battle just like any other battle. If, if an enemy were to invade this country, were to invade this city, the leader of the group would stand up and give this speech. They would say, think about your property, your home, your kids, your parents. You are fighting for them. And if you don't fight, you're going to lose all of them and everything that you have. You're going to lose your way of life and the potential for them to have a life as well. You fight for yourself and you fight on their behalf. It's no different spiritually. Fight. Fight for your home. Fight for your family, for your friends, that God would restore what has been lost. Nehemiah established a system where half the people worked and half stood guard. But even the people that worked were armed. And so it, it wasn't necessarily an either or proposition. Everybody was involved. And everybody was armed and on guard, no matter what they did. And we read that they set up a system where if the shofar was blown as a, a warning, then everybody knew to come running to that spot where the shofar was. And he understood, he, he understood that everybody was spread thin. I mean, they're, they're stretched all the way around the city working. And so they can't, they don't have enough people to amass them in one particular area to try to defend and protect. And so they have to go to this shofar alarm, and he knew that would work. But the main thing is that he declares is, our God will fight for us. Why? Why would God fight for them? Because they're doing what God asked them to do. Now, if they had just willy-nilly decided that they were going to do something on their own and hadn't had a word from the Lord, they couldn't necessarily be guaranteed that God would fight for them. But because God specifically said, go do this, they knew God was behind what they were doing. And so, the building continued. It wasn't allowed to slow or stop. And they, these people were so dedicated to the work, to, to finishing this work, it says that many of them didn't even take their clothes off. Now, I don't know how long they went without taking their clothes off. I'm sure they smelled real good. But they were so serious about getting this job done. He knew, Nehemiah knew, that because this was ordained, the enemy was not going to win. And as far as we can tell from reading the passage... Nobody, there's no indication in the text that anybody was afraid of the enemies. 
Now, it's very important for a leader to not be fearful. Because the people look to the leader as an example. And if the leader is fearful, then the people will be fearful. But there's all kinds of situations that we read about in the toga where the leadership was not fearful, but the people didn't follow the lead of the leader. And they were fearful. Prime example, the spies that go out to reconnoiter the land and come back and give a bad report. Moshe's opinion was, we can do this. And a couple of the guys said, you're absolutely right, we can go do this. But the majority said, oh no, we would never be able to do it. And we know where that got them. Forty years they got to wander around in the wilderness as a result of that. So when God sends us and He says, you can do it, we need to believe Him. And we need to do it. So in order for God's work to be done, everybody has to be on the same page and in tune with the leader. When that happens, then everybody works together as a unit to get the job done. And Nehemia was not uninvolved. He didn't sit up on a high chair in a tower somewhere and watch everybody work. He was as involved as everyone else was. And in fact, he led the way. In this particular case, everyone was equally convinced that what was being proposed by the leader was indeed the purpose of the Lord. And that's another key that has to be present. If, if you believe that, then you can move out with confidence and boldness in what you're doing. If you're not convinced of that, you're going to be timid, you're going to hang back, you're not going to be sure of what you're doing. And so with indetermination, these people, they owned a piece of the wall. That was their piece. And they were going to do the best job they possibly could to build that piece and to stand guard over that peace, and to defend that peace. And they each knew what their peace was. It was defined. We read. There are very distinct demarcations. This person went from this place to that place, and then the next person went from that place to the next place, and they knew exactly what it was that they were supposed to be doing. Now, did it say that Nehemiah got them all together and assigned them pieces of the wall. It doesn't say that. And in fact, several times it says, so-and-so built up the wall across from his house. Okay? And so he cl they claimed the sections that they were going to rebuild. Okay? So they made the decision about what they were going to do. And as far as they were concerned, that one piece that they owned, that piece represented restoration. It presented safety and security to them. Of their homes, their family, their friends, their way of life. Because they knew that what their way of life was ordained by God. And as far as they were concerned, those were things that were worth fighting for.
Now, Nehemiah was not, I'm sure he was like every other human being. Nehemiah was not perfect. You know, the, the, the text doesn't tell us everything. It tells us the story that we need to be aware of. So we don't know about all the conversations that people had with Nehemiah during this whole process. We don't know what kind of conflicts there were. We don't know any of that stuff. Because we're, God's trying to give us a big picture. Okay, so he doesn't necessarily tell us all the details of what transpired. But what impresses me is the, the people were absolutely convinced that what they were doing was the will of God. And they were willing to give their life for it. And with God and with God's purposes, no matter what those purposes are, in our lives today, that has to be the way that we do things as well. We have to be determined that if God said it, we're going to do it. No matter what kind of resistance we get from the enemy. We have to own the piece of the wall that God has given to us. Guard it, defend it with our lives, and build it. Not further tear it down and destroy, but build. Let's pray. Abba, the only thing that I can do personally as the leader of this congregation is do what you called me to do and not let the enemy sidetrack me or stop me. Be determined to guard, to protect, to die for what you've called me to do. Father, I lift up all of the people in this congregation. And Father, I pray that, that you will help them to also see where their piece of the wall is, whatever that might mean for them. You know, each person that worked on the wall, yes, they were all working on the wall, but their section that they worked on was unique to them. And so, Father, you know what constitutes the quote-unquote piece of the wall for each of the people in this congregation. But, Father, I pray that you will light a fire in your people. That they will come to own their piece of the wall and be just as determined to guard it, to protect it, to give their life for it. Because you have asked them to build that piece of the wall. Father, may you build up what it is that you're wanting to build up in this place. Restore the broken walls, the burned gates. In Yeshua's name, Amen. The Lord bless
bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Yevaret Adonai Vayishmarecha Yair Adonai Panav Alecha Vikunecha In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen.